Good morning. Apache Spark has come a long way since 2009 when a few of us started it as a research project at UC Berkeley. It has been an incredible ride. Now, almost six years later, I'm standing here in front of you and I am both happy and humbled by the excitement around Spark and by having here over 2,000 people. And this wouldn't have been possible without you. Data science, Spark users, Spark developers. So before starting, I would really like to thank all of you for making this possible. At Databricks, we continue to work hard to make Apache Spark better, contribute back to the community, as you heard in the keynote by Matei and Patrick. However, besides building great tools, we need to do something else. We need to train people. As many of you know, one of the main challenges we are confronting today in big data space is the scarcity of data scientists and data engineers. Everyone wants people like you. As, ed as, as educators, this challenge is very close to our heart. And during the past year, we spent a lot of resources at Databricks, a lot of effort, to do our part in alleviating this challenge. Over the past year, we have trained over 5,000 5, people on Spark. And furthermore, we have developed, and we are now offering, two massive open online courses. The first, the introduction to big data with Apache Spark, is taught by Anthony Joseph from UC Berkeley. He's there, so please go and thank him for that. And it's already started on June 1st. The second is scalable machine learning, and will be taught by Amit Tawalkar from UCLA, and it will start July 5th. Both these courses generated tremendous interest. We have more than 64,000 people registered for the first course and more than 26,000 registered for the second one. Both courses are free and you can still register for them. So next, I'm going to switch gears and talk about what we do at Databricks to make Apache Spark easier to use, easier than ever before. As all of you know, Spark is fast, has an expressive and powerful API, and it unifies existing computation model. In particular, it supports batch, streaming, and interactive computations, as well as machine learning and graph processing. These are the features which we all, for which we all love Spark, and which led to significantly simplifying big data processing, a notoriously difficult problem. However, while Spark goes a long way to simplify big data processing, this is only the first step. Big data processing still remains complex. Even with Spark, you still need to set up and manage your own Spark cluster. And Spark itself is still more complex to use and operate than existing single node tools such as R and Python. When we started Databricks, we set as our goal to address these challenges and to make big data truly simple. Databricks is a hosted end-to-end -end platform from ingestion to exploration and production, which allow you to build, deploy, and run your entire big data pipeline. Databricks is based on Spark and is currently hosted in Amazon AWS. Databricks include a cluster manager, which allows you to create tear down, dynamically scale up and down clusters, and includes a powerful set of tools which allow you to interactively query and visualize the data, build and publish customized dashboard, run programmatically arbitrary Spark pipelines, and it also supports third-party applications. Almost one year ago, we unveiled Databricks our service. And the response was tremendous, with over 3,500 people registered, signing up to use the service. Then, at the end of November last year, we released Spark, we released our service in limited availability. 
Again, the response was beyond our expectations, and in a few short months, we have more than 150 organizations using Databricks. And the response has so far has been great. So why Databricks? What can Databricks and Spark do for your organization? And to answer that question, I'm going to consider to describe three use cases from our customers, where data scientists and data engineers like you use Databricks and Spark to provide, to create value for their organization. First, Automatic. Automatic is an IoT, com IoT company which builds devices for cars to monitor the engine and driving dynamics. Then, with this data, Automatic builds data products which allow you to minimize the fuel consumption or reduce how much you pay for the gas. For example, telling you at what gas station to stop along the way. By using Databricks, Automatic was able to bring products to market much faster in as little as three weeks instead of two months. Radius is a market tech company which provides a listing for 25 million businesses by aggregating a variety of data sources. By using Databricks, Radius was able to significantly improve their product by providing this listing to their customers on a weekly rather than monthly basis. Finally, Celtra. Celtra is an ad optimization company. And while Celtra has a very strong data science and data engineer team, with everyone asking questions, this team was constantly overloaded. Celtra removes this bottleneck by leveraging the ease of use and flexibility of Databricks in Spark and democratize the data access within the enterprise. Today, Celtra increase the number of people who do data analysis by 4x and the number of data projects by 6x. Over the past few months, we are very hard to address the feedback from our users and our customers and to make Databricks available to more and more people. Today, we are taking the next step. Today, I am delighted to announce the general availability of Databricks. So now any of you can go sign up and use Databricks and Spark to solve your data problems. Next, let me say a few words about Databricks, our service. When developing Databricks, we focus on three key areas. Easy of use, as this is critical for increasing user productivity. Tight integration with existing both small and big tools, big data tools. Because we want to make sure that not only Spark experts feel at, feel at home on Databricks, but everyone who used only single machine tools like R and Python can be instantly productive on Databricks. And finally, security, because we want to enable mission-critical applications. Next, I'm going to cover a few features in each of these areas. First, easy of use. Databricks makes it super easy, not only to create tier, tier, tier down, scale up and down clusters, but also allows you to pick any Spark version. This enables you to test and experiment with the lightest so software before pushing it to production. Databricks, Databricks also allows you to programmatically run Spark jobs, and I am happy to announce that Databricks is the first SaaS offering which provides support for Spark streaming. And to make things easy, Databricks manages the fall recovery by automatically restarting the failed application, provide you alerts via emails, and allow you to go in the past and see any, the output of any job has run. Another way to make, simp uh, make simple thing, uh, things simple is to minimize the number of concepts, the number of tools you need to learn and operate. To this end, Databricks, Databricks is blurring the line 
between, between notebooks, dashboards, and job. Databricks allow you to publish a notebook as a dashboard or run a notebook as a job with just a few clicks. Second, we really focus on making sure, as I mentioned, that both Spark experts and people who never use Spark feel at home on Databricks. And we did that by integrating with the existing tools people are familiar with. In particular, for those of you who are R users, I am happy to announce that we are supporting Databricks supports R notebooks. These are based on Spark R, the latest addition to Apache Spark, and this is an addition to Scala, SQL, and Python notebooks Databricks already supports. Now, using these notebooks allows you to create sophisticated applications. And in order, so, so then what you do is a code. In order to manage that code, Databricks provide repository and a powerful versioning feature. But this is not, is not enough for many of you. When you have code and you want to manage it, many want to do that in their GitHub account, GitHub repository. In order to enable that use case, we provide a very tight, very tight integration between our versioning system and GitHub. Finally, Databricks allow you to connect your favorite BI tools, such as Tableau, Click Micro, and MicroStrategy, and run your favorite application, such as Zoom Data, Uncharted, Alteryx, and Data. Finally, for many of our customers, security is very important. And to meet their security requirements, we architected Databricks from ground up to allow it to run in your own Amazon account, provide encryption address, and provide sophisticated access control lists. And now, for the moment everyone has been waiting for, the demo. So please join me to welcome Ali Gossi, co-founder of Databricks and the head of product and engineering at Databricks. Okay, so I'm gonna start by logging into Databricks. All right, so this is Databricks. Um, for those of you who were at Summit last year, uh, you might be already familiar with uh, the notebooks that we introduced there. Uh, I've already pre prepared one of these, and I'm gonna look at them, this one, and it gives an uh, overview of what I'm gonna do in this demo. So last year, we focused on Spark streaming. So the demo was mostly about Spark streaming. We were using it in Databricks, and we were getting live Twitter data that was coming in, and we're creating dashboards. Uh, I'm happy to announce now that uh, Spark Streaming is in production in Databricks. If you're interested in uh, finding out how you can run Spark Streaming inside of Databricks, I urge you to go to Tadagata Das TD's talk tomorrow at uh, 2 p.m. This year, I'm gonna pick another use case. So this year, I'm gonna focus on machine learning. In particular, I'm gonna show you an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. I'm gonna start with ingestion of the data into the system, exploring it interactively, and then finally moving it all the way into pr production. So to provide you a little bit more detail, what I'm gonna really do is sentiment analysis. So I'm gonna learn the sentiments of a bunch of reviews. I'm gonna figure out if those reviews, it's reviews of products in a data set, if they're positive or if they're negative. Then I'm gonna serve this machine learning model, and then hopefully with your active participation, I'll be able to do live sentiment analysis of what you guys think. So, what I, if you can prepare now, at the end of this demo, uh, I'm gonna ask you to uh, pick out your phones and tweet, and we're gonna do some sentiment analysis on it. But I'll come back to that later. So to give you the detailed plan, I'm gonna first create and set up Spark clusters. Second, I'm gonna import a data set, which happens to be raw JSON Amazon data set that we use for research that contains 25 million reviews of different products. 
Then I'm going to interactively explore this data set using SQL and R. Four, I'm going to build a machine learning pipeline that does training based on this data set. Five, I'm going to productionize it in a pipeline that runs with no human in the loop. So it automatically just runs. And then six, I'm going to use this in an external web service that we've built and do the sentiment analysis of what you guys think about this demo. OK? All right, so let's start. So first, we need some clusters to work on. I've already set up a cluster here called demo. Uh, it's about a terabyte of memory. Uh, we can create clusters here really easily. So I'm going to create one. I'm going to call it demo2. Now, a neat feature that we have in Databricks is that we support different, you can have different Spark versions for different clusters. So you can here click and pick the Spark version that you want. In this particular case, I'm going to pick Spark 1.4. And a cool feature is that you can have Spark versions that have yet not been released. So you can get peak previews of Spark versions. Um, and I'm going to pick a little bit bigger cluster here. And we also support using Spot instances if you want to cut the cost, but I'm not going to risk it in this demo here. So. Uh, <laughs> using on-demand instances here. OK, and maybe give it a new name. We already have one called that. Call it demo2. OK, so this will now go off, spin up the cluster on Amazon, configure it for us, and tune Spark running on it, and it all happens. You don't need to do anything else. It takes about a minute or two, so I'm going to move on with the demo. We can come back and look at it. But this is something that otherwise could take months to uh, get started with. OK, so I said step number two, I was going to import some data sets, do some ingestion. So we go to tables here, and we say that we want to create a table. Now, this import tool lets you pick different data sources. You can use DBFS, which is our own internal Databricks file system, or you can use JDBC and hook it up with anything that talks JDBC or ODBC, any MySQL, Postgres, Cassandra. Uh, or you can upload local files if you want by clicking here and just uh, uploading the file that you have on your machine. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to import a file this data set that's sitting on S3. You put your credentials here in the bucket, and you can browse it. All right, so here we have a directory called Amazon, and this, ha this contains all the 25 million Amazon reviews. I'm going to preview these. And I know they are in JSON format, so it's a nested format here. And we see that it loads it up here so we can preview and see what it looks like. These are the different columns. And the two most important ones that we'll be looking a lot at is one is review, of course. That contains the actual review uh, of different products and the rating that the user has give, given. So it's the number of stars, one, two, three, or four, five. Okay? So let's call this table Amazon and just create it. All right. So the table is now imported into the system and we can actually work with it. It hasn't loaded in the data, it just knows that it's sitting on S3 and it has this schema. All right. OK, next, let's start doing some exploration. So we want to do some interactive exploration. For that, I'm going to create a notebook. And this time, as you heard from uh, Matei and uh, Patrick, Spark R is now fully part of uh, Spark. And Databricks fully now also supports Spark R. So I'm going to actually use uh, R notebook here. I'm going to call it Explore. And let's use this demo cluster. We see that the second one also has come up now. And we create this. All right. So Databricks now, every notebook you create on it is by default private. So no one else can actually access this notebook that I have. But uh, in case I type something wrong, I'm hoping I can get some help. So I'm going to click share here. I'm going to add some more people from the company that can help me out if I type something wrong or get something messed up. So let's add Matei. That's a good guy to have. Uh, say that he can edit. And I'll add Hossein to this one as well, who knows R much better than me. And maybe try to manage this. OK. All right, so they can come in and help me out if something goes wrong. All right, there we see. That's Matei. That's his icon up there. All right. <laughs> OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to explore this Amazon data set. In particular, I want to do a binary classification. I want to figure out from these ratings of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what constitutes a good review and what's bad. OK, so binary classification. Uh, learn to spell. No. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out if positive versus negative reviews. OK? So even though we're in our notebook, one of the neat things is that Spark uses data fr frames under the hood for everything. So what we can do is that we can actually use any, in any of these notebooks, we can use SQL, R, or Python. We can go between these very easily. So what I'm going to first do is I'm just going to cache in heap this data set that we had. So cache, table, Amazon. So I'm running a SQL command here in this R notebook that accesses this Amazon table. OK, while that's running, let me look at the reviews, what they look like. What's the distribution of these? So SQL. Let's count. Writing, and then we're going to order this also by the ratings. OK, so this does a group by and figures out for the different uh, ratings of stars how many we have. So we see that it's actually lopsided. We have a lot of fives, so people like products that they buy on Amazon, apparently. Um, so to do binary classification, maybe our cutoff should be here around four. So we'll have anything greater than four be positive, and anything lower be negative. OK. OK, that's helpful. <laughs> All right, so let me see here. So let's see what it looks like if uh, rating is greater than four. Let's call those good, and the other one's bad. And the group by here. OK, so now I'm looking if only at the ones that are greater than four. And we can see that if we, uh, we uh, have the cutoff be around four, we get roughly equal uh, balance between uh, good and bad. So that's what I'm going to use. All right, next, let's do some featureization. In particular, let's look for common words in the review column of this data set. All right, and I'm going to use R for this. So, here, we can use our data frames and go between our data frames and Spark data frames. So I'm going to say table, SQL context. So I'm accessing Spark SQL here. And I'm going to take this Amazon table, and I'm going to put it in a data frame like this. All right, so we have a data frame that contains all these columns. Um, let me select the ones that are uh, most relevant for what I want to do here. So from Amazon, I want to select in this data frame rating. And let's also see if a particular word, such as amazing, appears in a review. So it contains Amazon review, a word such as amazing. All right, so we've got a new data frame now. It has the rating, and it has this, if it contains the word or not. Let me rename this to a better name, maybe. Let's call it has words. And let's put this in a data frame. OK. We see here, red is Hussein, is looking at my uh, cell here. OK, so I renamed it to has words. Now, what we can do here is we can use uh, some frequency analysis. R has all these nice functions, so we can say we want to do a cross tab, which counts the number of times we get true and false this word occurs in this data set. So let's do a cross tab. Oh, stop executing things in my notebook. OK. And I'm going to pick um, maybe the amazing field and the has word. Oh. Let me see. What is the error here? Ah, OK. Misspelled. OK, I don't know who that was. Green, that looks like Matei. OK, perfect. Thanks, Matei. <laughs> OK, I need to work on my R skills. OK, so this is what that table looks like. And we can actually plot it. So if we say DF2, so we get another uh, data frame here. And uh, let's plot this using ggplot. So we can say ggplot DF2 and use an aesthetic here. and I'm going to plot rating, and then let's divide true over 
hey guys, stop uh, messing with my notebook. <laughs> okay. And let's add to this uh, geometry for bars. Um, I'm going to say identity equals, oops, stat equals identity. Okay, so this is the plot that we get. So this is how many, we see the occurrence of the word amazing is a lot for reviews that have fives and very low for ones that have one. Let's change this word amazing now to say return, which might have something to do with return policy. Okay, so we see that it's on the other side. So we have a lot of ones that have the word return in them. Okay, so there seems to be a lot of signal um, in this particular column. So let's use this now and build up a machine learning pipeline. So this is the kind of exploration you do with R and data frames, um, and a data scientist might do this. What I'm gonna do next is what the machine learning person would, uh, would do. So let's go here and create a notebook. And let's build a machine learning pipeline. And this pipeline, I'm gonna build it in Python, and I'm gonna use the same cluster as before. Okay, so here we have a Python notebook. So we can type Python in it. Let me share it. This time I'm just going to add Matei. Actually, I'll just add Shangri. Who knows a lot of machine learning? And it changes to manage. Okay. All right, perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a machine learning pipeline that trains based on these reviews. I've prepared the code, so I don't want to paste it in here. So what I've done is I've put it up on GitHub already. So we can go to GitHub, and we can pick Spark Summit here. And I prepped the code here in a notebook. In particular, I wrote it offline using IPython Notebook. So this is an IPython Notebook that I used earlier. And one of the nice things about GitHub is that they can display IPython Notebooks like this. So this is the code for this. So I'm going to pick the URL for this and go back here and look at versioning. So all our notebooks have versioning. So you can see you know, when we started, it looked like this. Now it looks like this. And you can link it to GitHub. So if you paste in this URL that we had from GitHub here, and you put in your token, you can link this up here. And then it synchronizes with GitHub and checks which versions are in GitHub and which versions are in Databricks. So we can see here there was a first version of it at some point that had this. I added some imports. And I think last night, Chiang Rui updated it. He didn't like, added some spaces. He didn't like the, you know, the style that I've used. So let's restore it to this version and use this. All right, so this is our pipeline. I'm gonna explain what it does. It sets up a bunch of things and puts them in this pipeline object here. So one nice thing about uh, Databricks is that there is a display function that you can apply to many of the different Spark objects. Uh, Databricks knows how to plot many of these things. So I can say display pipeline, and it figures out based on this object what, what's in it. So this explains what we have up here. So what we can see here is that we have a binarizer, a tokenizer, and a hashing TF. Binarizer, tokenizer, t hashing TF. The binarizer uses threshold 4.5, looks at the rating column, and then labels them with a one or a zero. So the label will be one if it's good, if it's above 4.5, and otherwise a zero. Tokenizer takes the review, the review text, and spits out a bunch of strings. These strings are then hashed to a feature vector of 10,000 length, and these are all fed into logistic regression, which then does some linear um, uh, regression here to figure out whether, uh, based on the review text, something is positive or negative. It will add uh, a prediction, which is gonna be zero or one, a probability of how sure it is of that uh, prediction, and there's some additional information here too. Okay. All right, so let's start training on this model. So for, for this, now we're in Python land, but I can again use data frames, so I can say table, and I can say Amazon here, and I can, now the syntax is different because it's Python, but I can say DF here, and DF now is a data frame in Python containing all these uh, columns, and I can now say model equals the pipeline that we built, and I'm gonna pass it this DF. Actually, I'm gonna do fit, and then pass it DF. Okay, so what this will now do is that it will go through the data set and do training based on this pipeline that we built. While it's doing this, let's look at this cluster that I created in the beginning, and we say that it's actually up and running. 
Uh, it has a Spark UI attached to it that you can go check out and you can see what the jobs are, the stages that are running. Uh, okay. okay, so the pipeline is running. Great, so as soon as this is done, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see what the results look like. So I'm gonna say model transform. And what model transform does is that it adds these, these columns, prediction and raw prediction to the original table. So I can say transform df, and I can use the data frame syntax to say I wanna select some columns because there are a lot of columns in this table. I'm just gonna select the original label that was in the data set, the predicted uh, label, and maybe the probability of how sure the algorithm is, and maybe the review text. And let's apply the display function of Databricks to this so we can see it as a table inside, of the, uh, inside the UI here. Okay, so we see here, this is the trained results. Let's look at them a little bit closer. Maybe I should zoom in. So what we see here is that uh, label and prediction in most cases are the same. So the algorithm has only looked at the review text and made up its mind if it's positive or negative, and it seems to coincide with the original label in most of these cases. So if we look here, it's almost always the same, except some cases it's getting it wrong. So let's look a little bit closer at what these mean. So for each of these, there is a probability associated to it. This is a nested JSON field, so you can open it like this. So in this case, it gave a label of zero, and it was 99% sure that this is a zero, and you know, there's a little bit that it might not be a zero. So let's look at the text, what it says. It says, I have the same complaint as everyone else. The mixture only seems to have one speed and is way too powerful. I'm not sure why there are six speeds either, as they all seem the same. If you want to beat something quick and thick, uh, then this might be just the thing. But for whisking an egg with the, with the included attachment, you better get ready to clean the egg off the walls. <laughs> okay, and this person is not happy. You know, they think they, uh, you know, they're on Amazon again, and they're looking to buy a new mixer, and they hate the money that they wasted on this. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty negative review. Uh, there are some positive ones as well. Let's look at ones that it, where it got it wrong. Okay, so here, let's see here. This is, uh, this is one where uh, it's said that it's a positive review, uh, but it was actually negative, and it was very unsure. 47% versus 52%. So the review is this. I like it, but I don't think I've used this long enough to see much difference. Why do I have to say more? <laughs> okay, so it is a little bit of a confusing review, as you can see. <laughs> okay, all right. Perfect. Okay, so we've got this. Now I wanna transition this into a production pipeline where there is no human in the loop anymore. Okay, so I wanna do this training now periodically, just you know, running with SLAs. So for that, I'm going to show you one of the features that our users love the most. It's called jobs. And with jobs, you can create pipelines that just run on a schedule themselves. We see here that there's a bunch of jobs already running. Let's create a new one. I'm gonna call it Amazon Train. What you can do here is you can, uh, you can pick a job, and you can upload your own jar files if you want. And your jar file can contain uh, your whole standalone application that runs Spark inside of it. It can do whatever you want to do. It, you compile it, you upload it. You can also upload just Spark streaming out of the box here. It could be a Spark streaming app. You say what main class it has and its arguments, and it's ready to go. But what I actually want to demonstrate today is something that I'm much more excited about, and most of our users actually use this feature instead, which is that instead of uploading your own jar, you can just say set notebook, and you can pick an existing notebook. So I'll pick the pipeline notebook that we just created together, and you can pick the revision, so we can take the latest revision here, and we select that as our job task. So it's now going to run this notebook that we created together. We can also specify that it should you know, uh, spin up a new cluster every time it runs this job. I'm actually gonna say that it's gonna use an existing cluster. I'm gonna say it's gonna use this, the other cluster that we created. You can give it a schedule here. I'm just gonna say that you should run it every hour, but you can use cron syntax and specify much more advanced options. And there are other options here too. So you can set, set up alerts if you want, so that you get uh, notified if anything goes wrong, you get an email. You can set up timeouts uh, so that it kills the job if it's been running for you know, say six hours. And finally, you can set retries, which is very important for Spark streaming. So if the job fails or crashes after a day, this thing will then relaunch it as many times as you want. All right, 
And then this will run on its own schedule. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to kick it off right away here. And we see that it's actually running now. One of the neat things when you're running notebooks as jobs is that you can click on the job and you can see the results as it's being computed. So here it's actually executing the code that we wrote earlier, and it's going to go through it here. Um, we see here it's, it's executing live. Um, and that's really useful for debugging. So you can go back here, and we can see at other jobs. So we have another job that Shangri set up, and has run a lot of times since yesterday. You can go to any of the runs, and you can click on any of the outputs and just see what it looked like. Okay, so this is a job that ran yesterday. Okay, perfect. All right, so we got this job. It's going to train, and it's going to train the model all the time. But what do you do after this? You're not done here, right? You want to do something with this model that you, uh, you've trained. You want to serve it somewhere. You might have a web page or some, you know, some mobile app that you want to uh, use this model from. And maybe when a user opens the mobile app, it makes a recommendation and says, hey, would you like to become friends with this person? So we want to serve these predictions. Okay? So what I'm going to show you now is our third party app. So if you click on applications here, uh, we, we showed you already at the previous Spark summits uh, two apps, Zoom Data and Pantera, that are third-party applications that run on top of the Databricks API. So we have a REST API that lets you do all these things like cluster management, notebook creation, execution of Spark jobs. And these applications, Pantera and Zoom Data, they're dashboard visualizations that uh, other companies built. This year, I'm going to show you something that we're working on, which is the Databricks model server, which is a third-party application running on top of Databricks. We can click on it here. And what this does is it serves models to anyone who's uh, uh, making calls into them. Okay? So to do this, I'm going to go back to this pipeline, and I'm going to make a call to dbutils, machine learning, and I'm going to say serve this model, the model that we just built, and I'm going to tell it what parameters to export back if anyone makes calls to this model server. So I'm going to say ID, um, let's say probability, and prediction. Okay. So we run this, and this will actually connect now and make sure that this gets served in the third party app, so MDC22. So let's go back here and click on the model server, and it should show up here. Okay. So get your phones ready soon. Right. So we see here it's serving this model, and you can actually inspect it if you want. Let me see. It's this model. You can inspect it, and you can add tweets here. Remember the words we used earlier? Let me see. What was it? Return was a bad word. And amazing was good. So you can do predictions like this. And you can see that the first word is a prediction of 0, and the second word is 1. So it seems to be working. OK? All right. So this is serving. So please pick out your phones now. And I'm going to now run a separate application. Actually, Xiangrui rewrote all of this. Uh, last night, 3 a.m. So it's a separate web app, which is just a Scala web app that all it does is listens to tweets that are coming in from Twitter, and it listens to two particular uh, hashtags. So hashtag Spark Summit and at Databricks. So it listens to those, and it just, if you connect to this web server, this web server will make calls into our model server and ask it for predictions each time a tweet comes in. So I'm going to run this now. And we've actually never done this since he wrote this in the middle of the night last night. So this is not rehearsed. <laughs> Let me go here. OK. All right, so I'm going to run this SBT run Databricks Summit, which runs this, uh, this web app. And I'm going to show you the code for the web app, but hopefully it starts up. OK. So this is a very simple web server listening to Twitter and making calls into this model server to ask for each tweet, whether it's a positive review or a negative review. OK? So please start tweeting now. And please include Spark Summit in a hashtag and at Databricks. OK? So we see some tweets are coming in here already. All right? So what I'm going to do in, our, in this browser is I'm going to So the, the server is running on my local machine on port 8000, so I'm just going to load it here. OK, oh, wow, OK. So people are tweeting already, we see, and the tweets are changing here. OK. So R and Spark, perfect match. So that's a positive review. It thinks it's 79% uh, uh, probability it's positive. 
OK, amazing, fantastic, awesome, great. I think someone is cheating here. <laughs> Nobody using the word return here. OK, great. Perfect. OK. All right. So that's it. Uh, I'm going to summarize what I've done. But before I do that, I'm going to show you one last feature, which actually came from the developers that use uh, Databricks. So I've written here in Markdown uh, some summary slides. And what the developers told us is that oftentimes, these notebooks, they want to present them to a bigger audience like this or to their boss. So they asked for a way in which they could do presentation mode or a dashboard mode where they could just put it up on a wall. Okay? So we've implemented this. So you click here, you click Dashboard, and you can then make slides like this. And you can just drag and drop the outputs of these cells. And then you can move it into presentation mode, which takes that very notebook and just presents it. OK, so let me summarize. Let's go to full screen here. OK, so I went through a lot of features. And this is all now G8. So you can go to databricks.com, click sign up, and get access to this. So the features that you saw, many of them are coming out in the coming weeks. Um, Multiple Spark versions, that's already there, so you can get that already today. Our support, also rolling it out soon. Versioning with GitHub integration and access control, so you can have you know, people helping you and you know, granting access to other people. And in the fall, you'll be seeing presentation and dashboard views, which is what I'm using right now to present this slide, and the model serving third party app. And finally, there was something that I didn't show you, which is approximate queries, which is really cool. Uh, this is a way where you can speed up SQL orders of magnitude by using statistical sampling. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, uh, go to Samir Agarwal and Kai Zeng's talk tomorrow. OK, so let me summarize this demo. And let's take a step back. So this demo was about machine learning. But really, it's much more than that. What we really did is we did a bunch of DevOps. We cr created Spark clusters that were tuned. We did ETL, where we pulled in a raw, unprocessed data set. We did exploration, and we used the power of data frames to go between R, SQL, and Python. We then migrated this into production setting, where there were no human in the loop, and it was just running behind the hood. And finally, I demonstrated the REST API that we have on top of Databricks to implement this model-serving API. So I hope I have convinced you that Databricks greatly simplifies end-to-end -end data processing. Thank you.